Okay. Are we ready to record? All right. John Plum is a former president of the Warren Astronomical Society, a former first vice president. He is a member of almost more astronomy clubs than you can count. He has founded his own astronomy club before and he will do it again. He has been interested in astronomy since childhood and still has his first cardboard telescope. He never had time for a real telescope until he retired at the end of 2001, and soon afterwards he joined the WASP. He first joined to learn to use his telescope, and then to learn about astronomy from fellow members. And now he is a member just to socialize with the rest of us. So he's going to tell us about a subject that is near and dear to his heart, as well as to mine, uh, space travel. And not the kind of travel where you actually go into space, but the kind of travel where you get in one of these types of vehicles, maybe that last one, and go see astronomy related sites. So without further ado, I give you John Boyle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to talk about space travel tonight, but as Jonathan implies, maybe not the kind that actually takes you out into space. The universe is big, and it's getting bigger. So it's hard to decide where to go on your astronomy vacation. The sun's a hot spot. Humidity's really low. If you don't want to go when it's this hot, you can go at night. <laughs> Venus is nice and warm, so a good place to go when it's cold in Michigan in the winter. <laughs> Titan has methane lakes, so a good spot for a seashore vacation. In Europa, you can meet the Europeans. <laughs> Saturn's got beautiful rings, so a great place for sightseeing. It's been hurricane season on Jupiter for a few hundred years, so I'd probably stay away from there. If you want to lose weight on vacation, you can go to the moon because you're going to have way less when you're there. Mars has got, I hear, a really great canyon, even bigger than the Grand Canyon, so that might be a good spot to see. Now, if you want to stretch your vacation dollars, you can head for a black hole. <laughs> a galaxy far, far away is far, far away, so we're not going there. Carl Sagan took all of his astronomy vacations on a certain pale blue dot. So that's where we're going to go tonight for our astronomy vacations. Now, I haven't been to the North Pole and the South Pole like Jerry Dunifer, so you're going to have to ask him about those. And I haven't been to Cellophane like Jim Shedlowski, so you'll have to check in with him about this pink building. But I have been all the way to Flint, Michigan, and there you can find the Long Way, Michigan's largest planetarium. It's at the Sloan Museum in Flint. It has two domes, an 88-foot diameter outside dome and a 60-foot diameter inner dome containing 292 seats. Between the bases of the two domes is a 10-foot wide circular corridor called the ambulatory. The outer wall of the ambulatory is lined with 50, two 55-foot murals of astronomical subjects and other interesting astronomy exhibits. Another place in Michigan that unfortunately is no more was the Michigan Space and Science Center that was at Jackson Community College from 1977 to 2003. They had a moon rock, a space capture simulator, a full-size replica of the Mars Pathfinder, and the capsule actually used on the Apollo 9 mission. But my favorite spot there, and my two sons' favorite spot, as you can see them posing here long ago, was a uh, scale model solar system outside of the museum. We never got out of the way to Pluto, which was in a library a few miles away. But later in tonight's talk, we're going to find out about an even bigger solar system model. I've always been a big fan of Disneyland and Disney World. And of course, my favorite place there is Tomorrowland in the Magic Kingdom. They used to have a couple of trips to the moon and Mars. The rocket to the moon opened at Disneyland in California in 1955, was renamed Flight to the Moon in 1967, and was duplicated at Disney World in Florida, but then it opened until 71 and was already outdated because we'd really been to the moon by then. 
And both Disney parks have changed the mission to Mars in 1975 to try to keep ahead of the game. And in 1995, it became the totally absurd and unrealistic extraterrestrial alien encounter. In 2004, it got even worse when this was converted to Stitch's Great Escape. But we still have a ride that's even better at Disney World in Florida, because in Epcot, we have Mission Space. This opened in 2003 at the former site of Horizon in Epcot. So they don't have this at Disneyland in California, it's something we've only got here in Florida. This is the inside of that Mission Space exhibit. You can choose to be a pilot, a commander, or an engineer and you can choose to take a trip to orbit the Earth or a mission to Mars, and you uh, fiddle with these uh, great controls and changes your views. Rocket jets is another thing those of you who are old enough to remember might remember Tomorrowland doesn't exist anymore. But they still have Space Mountain, which is dual roller coasters in the dark. Now something a little more realistic is some of the Smithsonian tours and I'll tell you about one that I went on and some that are still listed as going on now and in the future that I think you might be interested in taking. In 2003, Smithsonian had a four-day astronomy tour in Arizona led by David Aguilar from Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. The tour was based in Tucson and included Kitt Peak, where I got this great shirt, the University of Arizona Space Imagery Center, the Whipple Observatory, the Multiple Mirror Telescope on Mount Hopkins, the Astronomer's Inn that I'll talk about more in a moment, and several lectures in a hotel meeting room. You can go to smithsonianjourneys.org and see what they're offering now, and I'll give you a list of some of them a little later. So here we have some pictures of Kitt Peak, the Whipple Multiple Meter Telescope that isn't so multiple anymore, as we'll talk about. Uh, McMaster Solar Telescope, the second night that we're, McMaster, the second time tonight we use the word McMath, uh, since we just heard about the uh, McMath, uh, or Marty's talking about having his solar beams. And a roll-off room in astronomers in that we'll talk about. So Kitt Peak National Observatory has a visitor center, multiple telescopes, and several nighttime observing programs, which they call Nightly Observing Program, Dark Sky Discovery Program, Night of the Marvelous Moon, and the Overnight Telescope Observing Program. This is the McMath Pierce Solar Telescope that's also at Kitt Peak. <coughs> it's currently the world's largest solar telescope. The tower is 100 feet high, the slanted shaft is 200 feet long, and the aperture of the telescope is 1.6 meters. The shaft continues into the mountain, forming an underground tunnel where the sun is viewed at the prime focus. At the top is a 3 meter heliostat, which is a movable mirror that collects light and directs it down the tunnel. Unlike other solar telescopes, the McMath Pierce is sensitive enough to observe bright stars at night. When the Daniel Inui Solar Telescope on Maui is completed within the next year, it will become the world's largest solar telescope with an aperture of four meters. This is the MMT, the Whipple Observatory on Mount Hopkins. It was originally called the Multiple Mirror Telescope because it had six honeycomb mirrors, each 1.8 meters. These were replaced in 2000 with a single 6.5 meter that you see in this picture. So it was renamed the MMT, which is no longer an acronym, because it no longer has multiple mirrors. But here's a look at what those multiple mirrors look like. In the upper left, you can see a red arrow pointing to where I'm standing. And in the middle, you see my reflection in the multiple mirrors. So at the upper right, we have mini D, and at the left, we have maxi D. I took a look at the Smithsonian website. They have lots of tours of all sorts. And here's some of the astronomy ones that I saw listed. Astronomy and Natural Wonders in Hawaii, 2020 Total Solar Eclipse, Smithsonian and Space Academy, Total Solar Eclipse in Antarctica, and an Arctic Explorer by private train. So you can check the uh, Smithsonian website anytime to see the latest info on what tours you might be interested in taking. Also in Arizona, was a B&B, a bed and breakfast, called the Astronomer's Inn, which Rosie and I saw briefly on the Smithsonian tour and really loved it, so we went back on our own to stay there for several days. This doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately, but here are some photos I took at the time. On the roof, they have a little mini solar system, and the room we stayed in is shown on the right. This room had a dome ceiling, 
And in the back, in the center on the table, you can see the planetarium projector that you could set up in the middle of our bedroom and project the night sky onto the ceiling. And there was all kinds of exhibits around the room. Here on the left, we're in the uh, room with the roll-off roof. And on the right, we're in the dome that houses their biggest telescope. The astronomers in BNB had multiple telescopes up to 20 inch and knowledgeable amateur astronomers from a nearby astronomy club that showed us celestial objects in the scopes all night long, every night. Unfortunately, it's no longer a BNB, but since 2010, it's been just an observatory, still has multiple telescopes. Star Arizona is a telescope store in Tucson that we visited on the same trip. I wish we had a large telescope like this in Michigan and the clear skies that Jim has told us about in Arizona would be nice to have here in Michigan too. Sky and Telescope also has big astronomy trips like the Smithsonian does. And we've gone on a couple of those. Here's one we did to New Mexico in 2004 that was great. As you'll see from this list, that's two slides long, there's a lot to see there besides the astronomy exhibits. We went to the Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta, Institute for Meteoritics, Los Alamos National Laboratory, Bradbury Science Museum, Bandelier National Monument, the very large array that you can see in this photo, the Clyde Tombaugh Observatory, the White Sands Missile Range, the White Sands National Monument, the Museum of Space History, we had a talk on CCD astronomy, Apache Point Observatory, National Solar Observatory, Alan Hale came and gave us a talk about comet research, Bob Noya, who was then with Sky and Telescope Magazine, did a talk on Hubble photos. We went to the Roswell UFO Museum, definitely a site everyone needs to see. <laughs> Robert Goddard Collection and Three Nights of Observing. So here's the uh, Balloon Festival. This is held in Albuquerque every October for nine days. They get about 500 hot air balloons and 800,000 visitors. In the left photo, we're there at the crack of dawn watching them blow up the balloons. And in the right photo are just a few of the hundreds of balloons that get launched. The very large array was probably the most exciting thing to see on this trip. They have 27 25 meter radio telescopes in central New Mexico arranged in a wide, y shaped array. Each is mounted on double parallel railroad tracks. So the radius and density of the array can be transformed to adjust the balance between its angular resolution and its surface brightness sensitivity. In the left photo, you see a close-up of one of the dishes and some others further in the distance. And the right, we have our tour group posing at the base of one of the dishes, so you can get some idea of how big just the base alone is. The White Sands Missile Range had models of uh, several rockets, as you can see. The Department of Defense has this as the largest range, 3,200 square miles. They use it for research, development, testing, evaluation, and training. In the lower right, you can see why this is called White Sands. A tour bus is parked for a picnic lunch, and you see just how white the desert is there. Well, I just love the Roswell UFO Museum. <laughs> I talked to a lot of the people who work there in the gift shop, shown in the lower left, and by the exhibits, and I got the very definite impression that they didn't believe any of this stuff either. <laughs> So I think the people in Roswell and the people in the museum are just having fun with all the tourists who come to see the alien. <laughs> Another sky and telescope trip that I enjoyed and that I recommend to everyone was to see the southern hemisphere skies in Chile. I was there in 2014. One of the great things you can do in Chile is stand directly under the center of the Milky Way instead of having the center of the Milky Way being way low in the south like we see it here in Michigan. As I mentioned, when you go on these astronomy trips, you get to see the local sites, not just the astronomy sites. So in Santiago, here's some government building in the upper left. Rainbow Valley is an area with lots of minerals in the ground, so very colorful rocks and sands. The Altatio Geysers is in the lower left. We had to be there at dawn because the geysers show much better when the air is very cold. In the hot weather in the afternoon, the steam doesn't show up as much, and the steam condenses more in the cold uh, air in the morning, so you get a great view of these geysers, especially when they're backlit by the sun, like in this photo. And of course, any place, every place you go, it's always great to taste the local food, like we did in this Santiago restaurant in the lower right. We had some great views through big telescopes in the Atacama Desert, which
which is one of the driest places on earth. But I think my favorite things were naked eye objects. On the left we have the Ada Carina Nebula, and on the right the Tarantula Nebula. Both look great in scopes, but look just amazing naked eyes. And a thrilling naked eye sight is the Magellanic Clouds that I've heard about all of my life. They're satellite galaxies in the Milky Way, huge in the sky like the size of the bowl of the Big Dipper, easily visible naked eye. Herrero Tololo is the Inter-American Inter Observatory that we saw in Chile at 7,200 foot elevation. It has a long list of telescopes that you can see in the uh, lower right. For current Sky and Telescope tours, you can see skyandtelescope.com slash astronomy travel. Here's what I found when I checked out the list last month as I was preparing this talk. Total eclipse from an airplane off the coast of Chile last month. Total eclipse in southern hemisphere stargazing in Chile last month. Iceland and northern lights coming up this September. Australian observatories this October. Italy astronomy and science next May. Patagonian total eclipse in December of 2020, and a cruise to Antarctica, including a total eclipse in December of 2020. We did go to Iceland to try to see northern lights on another trip. Uh, Iceland's a great place to see waterfalls. They have tremendous waterfalls there, and rapids and water features, and a huge crack in the earth made by a tectonic plate movement that you can walk through. The word geyser comes from the Icelandic word geyser, which is a specific geyser in Iceland, and it was the first geyser known to modern Europeans, and that's where we got our word for geyser, from this particular geyser. You can see everybody there is dressed in pretty heavy coats. It was pretty chilly in Iceland, even in the summer when we were there. Now, we did go to Iceland twice. Once we went in the summer, and once we went in the winter. We went in the winter to try to see northern lights. It was very disappointing. It was a sky and telescope trip designed just for northern lights. And we purposely went when the sun was at its peak, so we would have the best odds. Not during a solar minimum like we have right now. We went out every night in our tour bus looking for northern lights, and uh, we mostly saw nothing. This was the best we got one night. We got a little green blotch. <laughs> Getting back to the U.S., the California Science Center is in Los Angeles. This is a free museum. You have an outside view on the left. In the center on the top, you can see some full-size planes in it, a couple of satellites on the right, and in the lower left. And of course, Buzz Lightyear, my favorite space traveler in the center. The Space Shuttle Endeavor flew 25 missions from 1992 to 2011, and it's displayed there at the California Science Center. You can walk under it, around it. There's a little mezzanine where you can walk above and look down. When we were there uh, in 11, so that's uh, eight years ago, they were talking about moving it to an outdoor setup where they would have it positioned vertically. But I don't know if they ever did that or it's still inside like it is in the time we were there and showed in this picture. Like many of you, my family went to the solar eclipse. I know you went to a lot of different places. We went to Madras, Oregon last August of 2017. Had family t-shirts made up. Here I am with uh, my three kids and three of my five grandchildren. And your wife. And my wife. <laughs> She's there too. Uh, we went to China in 2011, and I didn't know we were going to see anything about astronomy, but while we were there I heard about the Beijing Ancient Observatory. So we got to get over to that. They have a bunch of uh, old time exhibits all-time instruments. This one is called an armillary sphere. The armillary sphere, they said, is an instrument used to measure the coordinates of celestial bodies. The instrument is constructed of two bronze discs, one called the ecliptic armillary for tracking the sun, and the other the equatorial armillary for tracking bodies other than the sun. I have no idea how this works. But there were lots of other instruments there as well that had explanations. This was the planetarium they displayed there. Now the way this planetarium works is you sit inside of this ball when it's daylight on the outside, and there's holes drilled in the ball at the positions of the stars. So daylight comes in through these little holes, creating the star patterns 
all around you when you're sitting inside the ball. In a couple minutes, we're going to talk about another ball like this that's a lot closer to home that you can go sit in right now and get the same effect. If you get lucky enough to get invited to Bill Beers, there's a star party you can go to Michigan, go to in Michigan. He's got a huge backyard up outside of Cadillac, Michigan. So you can see in the upper photo, you can set up tents and telescopes out there. Here's Bill Beers with Ken Burton on the lower left, Bob Berta, Phil Martin, Jonathan and Diane, all enjoying the sights out of Bill's. Of course, there's stimulating conversation at Bill's place during the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens when you stay up too late at night. So Lestron has a factory in Torrance, California. I have a daughter in uh, Irvine, so it's in Southern California in the same general area. They don't offer any tours of the Lestron factory, but I managed to talk my way into getting a look around. They didn't let me take any pictures inside, so I had to take this outdoor picture. But I did see them uh, building some of their telescopes that they built here at this factory. Of course, they built a lot of them also in China. There's a great telescope store, also in Southern California, called OPT, Oceanside Photo and Telescope. I love to go into telescope stores even when I'm not shopping for anything. It's just great to see this huge variety of telescopes on display and all the accessories that they have available. Griffith Observatory is in that same part of the country. It's in Los Angeles. They say that 7 million people have looked through this 12-inch Zeiss refractor that was built in 1935, which they say is more than have looked through any other telescope in the world. Hmm. Well, the reason for that is that they have public star parties every night there, and it's been going, been going on for all those years since 1935. So that's how they've accumulated 7 million people looking through this telescope. Now, inside of the Griffith Observatory building, <coughs> one of the exhibits is called the Gunther Depths of Space Exhibit Hall. It has this large mural that you can see on the back wall of this room. It has large models of the planets hanging from the ceiling, and the mural on the back is called the Big Picture. It's 152 feet long and 20 feet tall. It's the world's largest astronomical image, a composite from several telescopes showing the Virgo cluster, on over one million stars and celestial objects. I sat down next to Al, and he told me <laughs> that the big picture shows an area of sky that would be blocked by my finger at arm's length. <laughs> so I ran right outside of Griffith, where I found Kepler, Galileo, and Copernicus just hanging around. And I told them they should go inside and take a look at that picture. But they just stood there. The dark sky meter is a way to measure how dark the sky is, and it's been replaced by an app on my iPhone. But a few years back, before that time, I did take a dark sky meter to all of the observing sites of this club and several other clubs and every place else I could think of taking it over a year or two's time. And the darkness that I was able to measure was the top of Haleakala, a 10,000-foot volcano on Maui, and the Texas Star Park. At both of those places, I measured a limiting magnitude of 6.4. The darkest I've seen in Michigan is at the Great Lakes Stargaze, where I measured a limiting magnitude of 5.5. I know that we have dark sky parks in Michigan that are probably darker than that. So here's the Texas Star Party. They have this every spring on a 3,500-acre, mile-high dude ranch in southeastern Texas. And you can learn all about it on their website at texasstarpottery.org. In the upper photo, you see a big field where you can set up your tent and your telescope for the whole week. And at the bottom, you see Jim entertaining us, as he's going to be doing next month when he sings at the end of the song. Spoiler. <laughs> Spoiler. <laughs> now, if you don't want to sleep in a tent, which I don't, you can stay in one of the cabins there. The cabin on the left, I stayed in with Dave D'Onofrio. And on the right, you can see another view of the field of the telescope set up. Here's Bill Bears with his Warren Astronomical Society sign, setting up his scope, and Jim setting up his at the Texas Star Party. As usual, we go in and saw the sights in the area, some beautiful scenery in the desert, and McDonald Observatory nearby. At the Texas Star Party the year I went, we had astronaut Don Pettit showing us some photos he'd taken from the International Space Station. 
And at the Texas Star Party, dinner's included. So great fun is just uh, picking up dinner from a huge cafeteria and then sitting down and having dinner with your astronomical friends and chatting about science and astronomy. It's one of the big scopes we have to look through. And here's some astro photos taken at the Texas Star Party. Phil Martin took these photos of the Triffid and Lagoon and Bill took a picture of Saturn and its moons. Now a site that I think every one of us should go see is the Rose Center for Earth and Space. This is in Manhattan, in New York City. The Rose Center is a glass box, 95 feet tall, on a concrete base, 25 feet tall, with an 87-foot diameter sphere in the center, representing the sun, and proportionally sized planets. It's not proportional to distance, obviously, but to the size of the planets compared to that sphere for the sun. The 429-seat Hayden Planetarium is inside the top half of that 87-foot sun sphere. For comparison, the Cranbrook Planetarium here has 75 seats. So you can imagine how big this planetarium is at the Hayden. A 360-foot long spiral cosmic pathway winds around the lower half of the sphere and has a timeline with information and pictures of the history of the universe. When you look down from that spiral pathway, you see exhibits on the floor, such as this huge meteorite <coughs> on the left. So the Rose Center should be on every astronomer's bucket list. Right next door to the, more, the Rose Center is the American Museum of Natural History, and the one astronomy exhibit there is called the Hall of Meteorites. On the right is the biggest meteorite I've ever seen. And around the sides of this room are many other large meteorites with great information about their history, composition, and so on. Stockholm, Sweden in June, is not a great place for observing. The lowest the sun gets at night is 8 degrees below the horizon. So this is about as dark as it gets there in the summer. But in nearby Denmark, you can see the oldest functioning observatory in Europe, the Round Tower of Copenhagen. It opened in 1642. It's 115 feet tall and 49 feet in diameter. A 686-foot ramp winds seven and a half times around on the inside to climb to the top. A dome at the top houses a six-inch refractor, which is open for solar viewing in the summer, but you can only do nighttime viewing in the winter because it doesn't get dark in the summer. On the big island of Hawaii, there's organized public observing every night at the Onizuka Center for International Astronomy Visitor Information Center at the 9,300-foot level of Mauna Kea. Mauna Kea means White Mountain. It's the tallest peak in Hawaii, on the Big Island of Hawaii, at 13,000 feet. But they don't let anyone who doesn't work there go up during the nighttime because it's an unpaved road and it's icy, slippery, and dangerous. So you can go up to the top and see the outside of the observatories at 13,000 feet in the daytime. But at nighttime, since you can't get up to the top to observing, you can go to this public observing that they hold every night at the 9,300 foot level. It is paved all the way up to there. There's no, no ice on the roads at that level. Also on the Big Island of Hawaii is the Imaloa Astronomy Center of Hawaii, an astronomy and cultural education center located in Hilo. It has exhibits and shows dealing with Hawaiian culture and history, astronomy, and the overlap between the two. Here's a view of the inside of the Imaloa Astronomy Center. They also have a 120-seat <coughs> planetarium. The Sagan Planet, Planet Walk is in Ithaca, New York, where Carl Sagan lived and taught. It became the world's largest exhibition in 2012 when it was extended with a statue representing Alpha Centauri installed at the Imaloa Astronomy Center on the Big Island of Hawaii, 4,740 miles from Ithaca. <laughs> on the scale of this model, the sun is 11 inches in diameter. One astronomical unit is about 100 feet. Neptune is a half a mile from the sun. And Alpha Centauri is half a world away in Hawaii. Back to Hawaii, we have the Maui Astronomy Club. They meet at parks and beaches at sea level. 
and invite the public to come take a look. On Maui, the latitude is 21 degrees, half of our 42 degree latitude here. So you can see Alpha Centauri, Beta Centauri, and the Southern Cross. I'm not much of an astrophotographer, but I took this picture in 2005 at 2.47 a.m. with a 15 second exposure. The bottom of the cross, you can see on the right side of this photo, is five degrees above the horizon. This is the highest that the Southern Cross gets when viewed from Maui. Another club on Maui is the Haleakala Amateur Astronomers. This is a club that is only for club members observing, and not for the public like the club that meets down on the beach. This club meets at the top of Haleakala, just below the 10,000 foot level, right in the midst of all the professional observatories. They have this concrete area where you can set up your scope. They have a couple piers permanently up there you can mount your scope on. They have a 11 inch celestron in the dome at the left. In the distance on the right, on the distance in the center, you can see a clamshell design open professional observatory. Here's a few people that have been up there. Diane and Jonathan, Bill Beers, Neil Parton, John Lyons. You can see we're standing on the uh, cement observing area for the Haleakala Club and we're very close to the professional observatories. And here's a satellite view of that area. And I show this because in the center you see the word club. And that's where the club's observatory is, surrounded by these great professional observatories. You can't get into the professional observatories, of course, but you can observe from the same place. I won't go into each of these different buildings. I did give a talk about this a couple years back where we talked about what each of these professional observatories does on Haleakala on Maui. Back here closer to home, we have the Great Lakes Stargaze that was mentioned in, <coughs> mentioned in tonight's uh, report of the survey. This is held every September in Gladwin, Michigan. They get 150 to 200 amateur astronomers from many clubs in Michigan and surrounding states, setting up tents and telescopes on a field for a few days usually Thursday to Sunday. It's a nice dark side place. As I mentioned, it's one of the darkest spots I've measured here in Michigan. Here's just a few of the clubs that I noticed set up there one year. Sunset Astronomical Society, Astronomy, Astronomy Club of Eastern Michigan University, Seven Ponds Astronomy Club, the Ford Amateur Astronomy Club, our own Warren Club, and the Open Club. And there were several more. A great thing at the Great Lakes Stargaze has seen all the variety of telescopes that are there. When you wander around the field in the daytime, you can ask the owners of all these telescopes to tell you all about them. And then when you wander around the field at nighttime, everybody's very anxious to share their views and very friendly and accommodating, so you can get a look through all of these different telescopes. Here's just a few people that have gone to the Great Lake Stargaze. The bottom photo shows us going out to dinner, one of my favorite activities. There's a town of about 15 minutes away, Gladwin, where you can go out to dinner. Some more chatting with astronomy friends. Norb Vance from Eastern Michigan University does a rocket launch every year at the Great Lakes Stargate. They have a swap meet there where you can buy assorted trinkets, books, meteorites. Uh, they have a door prize drawing where not everyone but most people come to, to win a door prize. There's a few winners one year. Diane Hall, Jim Frisbee, Bob Fitzgerald, me, Bob Boswell, Bill Beers, Doug Bauer, Bob McFarland. Some of these people from our club and some from the Ford Club. Uh, this year, uh, I've gone several years to the Great Lakes Star Games. This particular year, David Levy was a speaker telling us about comets. If you get really lucky, you might get to the Great Lakes Star Games on a day when Joe Toko is making pizza. He brought along this little oven that's shown in the lower center photo. He rolled out the dough, put on the toppings, <laughs> made pizza for all of us. Well, not all 200 people were there. Here's a uh, license plate I spotted at the Great Lakes Stargate. I think this belongs to somebody in the Ford Club. Reminds us of our favorite nebula here in Michigan. <laughs> this is the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Another place that's not too far away. You can easily drive there in about five hours. Lots of great sites to see in Chicago. The Museum of Science and Industry is a fabulous building. If you haven't seen that, it's worth the whole day spending there. So the Adler Planetarium 
has within it the Atwood Sphere. Where have you seen this before? The Atwood Sphere is Chicago's oldest planetarium, dating to 1913. It's 17 feet in diameter, has 692 holes drilled through its metal surface. The holes allow light to enter and show the positions of the brightest stars. So, the same as I showed you in that ancient Chinese observatory. You get inside a ball, there's lights on the outside, and the primitive planetarium is made by holes in the sphere. <coughs> Just a few other things they have at the Atwood Planetarium in Chicago. Uh, some of the uh, talks, exhibits, and displays. What's a planet, mission, moon, solar system, community design, universe walk, planet explorers, telescopes through the looking glass, Clark family, welcome gallery, astronomy and culture. The Smithsonian has the National Air and Space Museum, another absolutely essential spot that everyone interested in astronomy has to get to. Admission is free, as for all Smithsonian museums in Washington. Seven million people visit the National Air and Space Museum every year. And it amazed me to learn that this is the most popular Smithsonian Museum. More popular than the Museum of Natural History, the Museum of American History, the American Art Museum, the National Portrait Gallery, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Zoo, the National Museum of the American Indian, and the Hishorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. Well, I went to the Air and Space Museum and there was nothing there. You have to think about that a little bit. Air and space. <laughs> well, they really do have things. Uh, and the upper left, you see the spirit of St. Louis. And the lower left, you have the moon land. And we have everything in between. Here are some actual airplanes from defunct airlines, Eastern Airlines. Uh, Northwest Airlines, you might recognize on the right. TWA in the background. Here in the Air and Space Museum is Apollo Soyuz test project, a model of the first joint US Soviet space flight in 1975. Here's a better view of the moon lander in the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum in Washington. A model of the Hubble Space Telescope, some full size rocket models. Neil Armstrong's spacesuit from the Apollo 11 moon landing is displayed in the Wright Brothers Gallery across from the piece of the Wright Flyer that Neil Armstrong took with him to the moon in 1969. The reason these two are in the same room is to emphasize the fact that it was only 66 years from the Wright Brothers' first flight in 1903 to the moon landing in 1969. Yeah. One of my favorite sites in Washington, D.C. is this fabulous statue of Albert Einstein. Huh. As you can see, it's big enough to sit in his lap, and I've got great photos of myself at various stages in my life, my children, my grandchildren sitting, sitting in Albert Einstein's lap. In Florence in 1984, I stood next to another famous person, Galileo. He's in a sarcophagus, which is a stone coffin, so he didn't say much, just like Albert Einstein. But it was still thrilling to stand right next to him. When we were in Poland doing some genealogy research, I saw statues of Copernicus in multiple places. Here he is in Warsaw and Krakow, and amazingly carved from salt in a salt mine. Hmm. In this salt mine they had carved full rooms, furniture, famous people, amazing sight. <coughs> the Frontiers of Flight Museum is at Dallas Love Field. They have the Apollo 7 command module. This isn't anywhere near the site of the Smithsonian. It's just one gigantic room, but it does have some interesting exhibits, including 30 aircraft and space vehicles. Charlie Duke walked on the moon in 1972, and my granddaughter and I were thrilled to meet him and his wife when we were at the Frontiers of Flight Museum in Dallas. The Exploratorium is a huge science museum in San Francisco. It has a little bit of astronomy in it, but mostly other sciences. The quote on the Exploratorium website tells you all about it. At the Exploratorium, you don't look at exhibits, you play with them. Dance with your own shadow, levitate, touch a tornado, mix colors, break light apart, stop time, 
start a conversation, capture a wave, explode your mind. So a great place for kids and adults to have fun and actually participate. Here's a few of their activities. Pixels, pictures, and phones. Uh, pupil of your eye, balancing ball. You can read the rest of these. The business about the tornado, I think we referred to this exhibit that my grandson is playing with on the left. Uh, they're blowing air rapidly out of this orange cone on the lower left. As you know, moving air has lower pressure than still air, so the low pressure in the air flow and the high pressure surrounding keeps the ball in midair. Here's some of the planetarium shows at the Exploratorium after dark, made for space, lunar lore, out of this world. My grandson took this literally about playing with all the exhibits, so he was not dissuaded by one that had a little uh, area around it trying to block it off from him. <laughs> the Lawrence Hall of Science is on a hill above the University of California, Berkeley, with the Great View of San Francisco Bay. You can barely see the Golden Gate Bridge in the background in the center, and Alcatraz Island to the lower left of the left end of the Golden Gate Bridge. There's a DNA model on the outside of the Lawrence Hall of Science. And I think it gives you a better feel for DNA to look at this model in 3D than to just look at the usual 2D pictures that we're used to. They have a small 45-seat planetarium inside the Lawrence Hall of Science in Berkeley. And here's some of their exhibits, planetarium, augmented reality, stargazing, science on a sphere. They have a gift shop, as every museum has, so lots of goodies you can buy there, like you can here at the Cranbrook gift shop. Boston has a great museum of science. There, too, is only a small part of astronomy, but the whole science museum is a fascinating place to see, and it's a pretty big place. Some of the astronomy section has full-size models of Apollo and Mercury capsules. <coughs> There was an exhibit about how we get information about the universe from light spectra. Full-size models of Apollo and Mercury capsules. Kids can crawl into the Apollo command module and watch the first moon landing from the cockpit seats. You can stand in front of a full-scale model of the cockpit of the lunar module, see moon rock fragments and other memorabilia from the era. This is still at the Boston Science Museum. They also have planetarium shows and observing. They have an 11-inch schmidt cassegrain telescope in the Gilliland Observatory. Here you can see a long line outside waiting to get a look through this telescope. It reminds us how lucky we are to be able to go out to Stargate and look through telescopes every month without having to wait in long lines. Well, the Kennedy Space Center is a definite must-see also for anyone that's at least been interested in astronomy. My favorite thing there was the way they displayed the space shuttle Atlantis. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this display is set up. The building that houses the space shuttle Atlantis begins your tour with a movie. So you're standing up in front of this huge movie screen and you see Atlantis taking off. Then you see a view of the Earth from space from the space shuttle Atlantis. Still watching this movie. You see a spacewalk from the Atlantis. Then you see the Atlantis coming in for a landing. And as the movie comes to an end, and Atlantis comes in for a landing, you see that the movie is really being projected on a very thin curtain. And the curtain slowly rises up, and you realize the actual space shuttle Atlantis is right behind that curtain. Mm -hmm. So then you walk through the area where the curtain used to be, and you find yourself standing right next to the space shuttle Atlantis. It's just a beautiful and amazing sight, especially the way they've positioned it, set up on an angle so you can get a great look. Walking under it, walking over it on some mezzanine level, walking around it. The Atlantis went on 33 missions from 1985 to 2011. They have it positioned with the cargo bay open, so you can look into the cargo bay and get a good look at the Canada Arms. If you haven't seen a space shuttle, you've got to get to see one of them. It's an amazing sight. Uh, here's a model of the Hubble Space Telescope, still at the Kennedy Space Center. 
some uh, model rockets full size with a plaque under each one telling you the history. This is a building all of us have seen lots of times in pictures and on TV called the Vehicle Assembly Building. You can't appreciate how big this building is without seeing it in person. The American flag on the Vehicle Assembly Building has stripes nine feet wide. Each star is six feet across. The blue field with the stars is the size of a professional basketball court. The flag is 209 feet high and 100 feet, 110 feet wide. The bay doors are the largest doors in the world, 456 feet high. As you know from seeing pictures of this, the upright space shuttle has moved in and out through those doors. One of the world's most watched timepieces is the countdown clock. It was used for the Apollo missions and then was relocated from the Launch Complex 39 after it was replaced with an updated clock. So now it's just something for the tourists to pose next to. SpaceX stands for Space Exploration Technologies. As you know, this is Elon Musk's company. Here's their building that we saw at the Kennedy Space Center, but we didn't get inside, so I have no idea what's going on in there. Launch Tower, where the Apollo missions took off. Mission Control mock-up, what Mission Control looked like back at that time. Now the next most amazing exhibit, I think, at the Kennedy Space Center after seeing the space shuttle is a full-size Apollo Saturn V rocket. They have this laying down, as you can see, so you really can get up close to all parts of it. They have the stages separated, so here you're looking at the first stage, and then you can see a little separation point in the distance in the second stage, in the distance in this picture. So again, you get to walk around and view it from all sides and really appreciate how big it is. When you're standing at the bottom of the first stage, you're way below these huge rocket engines. When you walk all the way down to the other end, you see this model of the command module. Here at the Kennedy Space Center, they have science experiments you can participate in. You can fly the shuttle. You can manage a Mars station, as my granddaughter's doing in the lower right corner. Uh, they tell you you're in uh, charge of some space station we've set up on Mars, and they give you various problems to solve, taking care of the situation on your Mars base. <clears throat> now, there's places I'd like to go that I haven't been to. I'd love to see Arecibo. This was featured in one of my favorite movies, Car Contact, based on Carl Sagan's novel by the same name, in which Jodie Foster listens for science and space. They do have public observing on the observation deck at Arecibo. It's in Puerto Rico. You can stand on the observation deck. I haven't been there, but I'd love to see that. If you go on Google Earth and look at Puerto Rico, it's very easy to find this huge dish. So it shows well from space. They have exhibits there at Arecibo, indoor exhibits, and an auditorium for some talks. Another place I'd like to get to that I haven't been is the Greenwich, Greenwich Prime Meridian. Here you can see somebody standing one foot in each of the two hemispheres. They call it a journey through space and time, the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England, home of the Prime Meridian, zero degrees longitude. The Johnson Space Center in Houston is another place I'd like to get to I haven't been. You can compare the Apollo Mission Control with today's Mission Control. <clears throat> also at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, they have a Starship Gallery, Astronaut Gallery, Independence Plaza, Mission to Mars, and a NASA tram tour. Here's a place I'd really like to go on vacation. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to make it to that one. In the 1997 movie Annie Hall, Woody Allen's character is named Alvy Singer. In a flashback to when Alvy was a child, his mother took him to a psychiatrist and the following dialogue ensued. His mother says, he's been depressed. All of a sudden he can't do anything. The doctor says, why are you depressed, Alvy? His mom says, tell Dr. Tucker, it's something you read. Something you read, huh? The universe is expanding. The universe is expanding? Well, the universe is everything. And if it's expanding, someday it will break apart. 
And that will be the end of everything. What's that your business? You stop doing his homework. What's the point? What has the universe got to do with it? You're here in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is not expanding. It won't be expanding for billions of years yet, that will be. And we've got to go try and enjoy ourselves while we're here. So the point of this slide is, enjoy yourself while you're here and go see these astronomy sites. The universe is expanding at 72 kilometers per second per megaparsec. This means that for every 3.3 million light years further away from the Earth you are, no matter where you are, is moving away from Earth 72 kilometers a second faster. So wherever you go on your astronomy vacation, go soon. The longer you wait, the farther you're going to have to go to get there. <laughs> That was a wonderful presentation, John. Only because but, I mentioned your name several times? Well, I, no, I think you ought to add one thing to your list, and, and you really should go try to see it in Tucson, Arizona, the Karis Muir Lab. Ah, yeah. you yeah. talked about that in one yeah. of your talks. Yeah. Yes, that sounds like a That great should be on everybody's bucket list. But in, should you actually see them making these giant mirrors? Absolutely. Awesome. Wow. Bill? In years and years and years ago, when I used to ride around the country on my motorcycle, I ended up backpacking into White Sands, which is a national park. And you get out there, and they actually tell you this, but I went out there and found out. When I took out my little stove and started cooking my dinner, and I took in five liters of water when I went in. I stayed there two days. All of the sand underneath um, my little burner stove turned to super white powder. Wow. And it turns out the white sands are white because it's not silica sand, it's magnesium sulfate sand. Really? I which is plaster of Paris. Huh. Yeah. Whoa. Mike. I believe so. Yeah. It's from Seattle. <coughs> Seattle? Huh. Got moved to New York. Oh. More questions? Jonathan. Jonathan, you, uh, I don't think I missed it. Have uh, you been to the Calvin Zoo here too? No. So all of the, uh, about 60% about of the collection of the Jackson Air and Space Museum was purchased and moved to Calvin Zoo here too. So all they don't oh. have is the Apollo 8 capsule, or the... Oh, nine 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 nine. Yeah, they don't have that anymore. Uh, they, they lost many of the NASA items, but they still have some amazing stuff. They have uh, they have one of the chimp uh, of the three uh, Mercury Jura chimps that we sent into space. They have one of their uh, spacesuits. They have uh, a NASA branded SR seventy one Blackbird. They have uh, just some really amazing stuff, and it is, to a certain extent, a snapshot in time, so they had an ISS, a huge ISS exhibit that was deployed when I was a child, before the ISS started construction. So uh, it was going to visit it at the Kalamazoo Air Zoo was really like returning to my second grade self, and it was something. So I would highly recommend it if you're in Kalamazoo. Really well, it sounds like a great place to see, and it's right on your way to Chicago to see the Agro Planetarium. That's yes, right. the Kalamazoo on the way. More question? Okay, thanks.